welcome to Life Hurts, God Heals. I'm one of your hosts, Kim Ward. And I'm your other host, Kurt Flagel. And on this particular episode of Life Hurts, God Heals, we're continuing a conversation with our guest, Adam Ormord, that we started in part one of his story. We're continuing to hear about how Adam was healed from his father wounds, specifically how spiritual practices have helped him in that healing process and what practices he's engaged in these days. If you found part one of Adam's story powerful, and I'm confident you did, I'm just as confident you will find his practices just as engaging. So thanks again for listening. And if you're ready, let's jump right back into the conversation with Adam that we started in part one of Healing Our Father Wounds. Our identity, you know, is a message of really what we think of God's identity. If I believe that I am this thing, that reflects how I view God. So as you're beginning to believe that you're the beloved, which means you're beginning to believe God is perfect love, you said that you you were receiving this, but you, you didn't have a container to yeah. hold that message of God. So what are the practices that you've learned that might maybe help other people who are dealing with their father wounds? What kind of practices are helping you hold that message of God as mm. your as your father who loves you perfectly and you are his beloved. Well, there's there's a few. I I really caught hold of the ideas of silence and solitude and stillness. My personality was okay with that, being kind of an artistic person who, you know, could be viewed as maybe lazy <laughs> by some <laughs> standards. So like it wasn't like the biggest like paradigm shift for me to say I'm willing to sit on a bench on a prayer trail for a while and, and not be productive, quote unquote. But silence and solitude and anything that kind of was this place where I was invited to not have to perform was huge for me. I didn't have to memorize anything. I didn't have to learn any more information about God. Yeah, I didn't have to even write out the, my right thoughts you know, about God. I really needed to just be quiet and be with God. And so that was a, a practice that I took to like a fish to water. So I'm okay with with the quiet and I'm learning be still and know that I'm God Psalm 46 10 and I and I recognize that just the metaphor of that entire psalm being one of calamity and sounds of war and destruction and apocalyptic imagery and then like right in the middle of that be still be still in the middle of it all this is the work of my heart this is the melody of my soul to become a person who listens softer. What's your rhythm for that? Do you have silence and solitude as a weekly rhythm, monthly rhythm, mm -hmm. yearly? Like, what does that look like for you? First of all, it, it changes according to different seasons and rhythms of my own tiredness or whatever. And that's probably another thing would be the gift of giving yourself permission to kind of go with, God's invitations rather than your own expectations of what you're supposed to do mm. um, and the way that you're supposed to do it. So for a daily rhythm, I've gone through seasons where it would be every day, waking up early in the morning and, and loving getting up before anyone else in the house. There were seasons where I had like a prayer closet and I had a, a, a speaker in this like storage room that I would go into and it's playing like Bethel songs and other things like that. So I've had those seasons too. And once a month, for sure, I take a soul care day now where I have the freedom to leave my work here at my desk and trust that God's going to take care of all that, which is a great reminder anyway, and just go spend time on a trail or, you know, driving to see my spiritual director and just kind of looking forward to a day that's going to be kind of filled with yeses to God. Like, what do you, what do you want to do, God, today? How do you want to delight in spending time with me? And hearing God ask me that question, saying, yeah, that sounds fun. So that's been a journey of fun discovery that's almost felt like an adventure on a monthly basis for me, the, the adventure of saying yes. So that rhythm has shifted and morphed and, and looked differently 
I feel like right now I'm and I'm still in a transition to to a new job, new ministry, and so right now I'm feeling kind of even the heaviness and the effects of transition still three months into it, and I've just noticed I've been really tired lately. Now I'm more like whenever God gives me the opportunity to take a, a chunk of time in the day, or if it's just once a week, to get away with God and to practice some of that silence and solitude, I'm okay with letting silence do the heavy lifting. I go to a spiritual director who lets me be silent if I need to be and listen to God. I have been a part of a listening group now for a while uh, that meets monthly. Mm. And the whole idea there is that we're we're not trying to fix others or offer advice or any of that other stuff. We're just there to listen to God with someone as they're telling parts of their stories, which I hope people are going to be able to do with this podcast. Just listen as someone tells their story and then be listening to God. So that's something I, I practice. And that's in the context of, of a small, trusted, very trusted community with some very serious boundaries about, you know, what is said here stays here. So I've got different elements like that in place to help me in this kind of practice of silence and solitude as well. Is there any others that help you create a container to hold God's love? I've just been learning how to do things I like to do with God. I told you before we started recording, I actually like to play golf. You asked if I do things that are relaxing and you know, most people wouldn't think golf is relaxing. It's a, it's a mind trip game that can ruin your day. But I am trying to, whether I'm out for a run or I'm out playing golf to invite God into that space and to actually say, Jesus, you wanna go for a run? <laughs> and as I'm walking to the, my golf ball, even if it's like a really hard slice into the other fairway, I'm saying to myself, my soul is quieted and still, my soul is still and quieted like a, a weaned child with his mother. Like I'm trying to um, be really aware of God's withness with me and his delight in being with me, his willingness to go for a run with me, his willingness to sit with me in my backyard and do nothing. I grew up in the satanic panic of the 80s. Uh -huh. Dungeons and Dragons was oh, the yeah. thing that if your kids played that, they would become serial killer Satanists, right? And so my, my father burned my D&D books. I grew up in that environment. And Me too, what, brother. <laughs> and when, like, I just ended up buying my D&D books again. My dad paid me for my books and then burned them. And I just went out and bought more books and then hid them with my porn magazine so you couldn't <laughs> find them. So like they were there. But it was when I first came to faith in my early 20s that what God did was one of his invitations to me was to put all that aside and to focus on him. And it wasn't for the reasons what I learned in the, in the following years of following Jesus. It wasn't for the reasons my father and mother were afraid of. It was actually that that was my idol that I turned to to feel safe actually from them. So when they were burning my books, it felt like they were burning me. One of the only places of safety I had my own imagination to hide from the reality of the pain that I felt they were the major components of inflicting in my life. Mm -hmm. But what God showed me was that was an escape that wasn't him, that that was an idol that I turned to to hide. Mm -hmm. And in the last five years, he's brought an opportunity back for me to play with people who are not believers and for me to be around people. And I've wrestled hard with that, going, where, okay, God, where are you in this? And what God has shown me is he's brought me back to playing India exactly with what you said. First of all, I get to be with people who are not believers. I have a forum to engage in relationship intentionally with people who do not follow Jesus, to love them where they are. But also for me, God has brought me back to, to do what you're doing with golf is to invite him in to no longer let that be my escape, mm -hmm. but actually let it become a storytelling device to help me understand the real reality of who I am and explore aspects of God in myself in the process of playing a character in a story 
for instance, in the game that I'm in right now, in fact, I'm playing a character, I'm playing as an Enneagram 8. And as an Enneagram 7, God has told me in my silent retreats over the last few years how I have neglected my 8 wing. And he is asking me to invite him in to help me strengthen that eight wing, because in this next season of ministry, I need the challenger side of me to rise up. You know, Mm. I've leaned heavily into my six wing and has softened a lot of my seven tendencies, Mm. right? And they asked us the first night, why do you play D&D? And I got to say, I am playing this game to do the opposite of what I did as a kid. I said, I used to play to escape and pretty much everyone who was in that game who was not a Christ follower was going, oh yeah, yeah. I'm like, but that's not why I play now. Yeah. And now I'm exploring the mm. reality because I've learned to invite God to play with me. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah. That. That's so powerful. Yeah. I've learned being able to have a container for belovedness that that incorporates everything that you think it does. Playfulness and delight and wonder and joy and fun with God in this kingdom adventure. It's all part of being the beloved and having the freedom to say, God, I I wonder how you would like to be with me today. Mm. You know, sensing the freedom to ask that question and then having that kind of that voice to listen to your shepherd's voice and go, ah, yeah, that sounds good. I think I'd like to do that too. What advice would you give somebody who wants to step into healing from these kind of parent wounds, what would be a step, maybe a first step that you would suggest for them? I think Kim used the word trust when we prayed earlier. I think it would be something related to moving toward another person courageously and kind of as an act of trust that God would lead them to a person who could handle their story, hear their story, model and represent God's perfect love and trust that as God is kind of moving them in that direction, that is God. And they would, they would take those steps. So I think the step is toward another person who can listen well. There's something about confession, the act of confession that's good for the soul and, and I don't think that means that we're going to someone to absolve us in any way, shape, or form, but someone who will hear us and see us and say, that's it, I see you, and I like what I see. And even more than that, God does, hmm. is a move toward that kind of freedom, that kind of healing, that kind of deeper work of transformation that will be long-lasting. Would you say that that person could be described as what spiritual directors do? I certainly would. Or spiritual companions? Yeah. Spiritual friendship, spiritual companion, spiritual director. Look, I mean, if the thing that's stopping you from doing this is, who would I go talk to that I could trust? A spiritual director is a kind of person who is trained to be a great listener and keep themselves out of the way so that you can hear God telling you, you are the beloved. Now that's, that's a good spiritual director, right? Uh, You'll know if you go and all of a sudden you feel like you've just been preached at or, you know, somehow given this long list of things to do to, you know, to, to make yourself better. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about someone who is curious has practiced this art of listening softer and can be present to you and not turned off by whatever it is that you're carrying that kind of just needs to be brought into the light. So I wrote a poem years ago for one of my sons who was struggling, and I would love to share it that maybe this would resonate with somebody here today because this is the invitation, I think, for for all of us. It's short. It just says, my child... I see you and I hear you. As tears rush from your innocent eyes, my heart breaks for you. You call yourself broken. I call you beloved. You call yourself wounded and I call you wonderful. You call yourself unloved and unworthy. 
and I call you unaware. You are unaware of the potential I see in you, the beauty I see in your soul, the love rushing up in my heart every single time I think of you. There's nothing more important to me than knowing you and being known by you. Nothing. When you feel alone, I'm not as far away as you think. When you fear my anger or disappointment, I am at that very moment on the lookout, waiting to see you on the horizon, returning to the place where we can once again delight in each other and your heart can finally know home. That's the kind of message that we all need to receive. So I don't know if I wrote this poem for one of my kids. I wrote it for me. Mm. And it's the message I keep on desiring to live into. You call yourself broken and I call you beloved. And you say you're unloved and unworthy, but I, I say you're just unaware. So the gift that someone else can give any one of our listeners is to listen well, to listen someone into a place of healing where the Spirit of God can do the work, not the person, but the Spirit of God. Love's family. That's, that's how I've heard the Trinity described. Love's family. I love, I love that. Mm. But love's family can say to you, welcome home. Here's a spot at the table. You belong. That's beautiful. And I would love for you to pray that over people, you know, for them to discover that. Before we do that, just a practical matter, because you are a part of Grafted In and the ESDA, where there is a whole list of spiritual companions, spiritual friends, spiritual directors, can you give people like, a place to go to actually begin to peruse the list of spiritual friends and directors. Yeah. You're on that list, right, Kurt? I am on that list. Yeah. If you go to www.graftedlife, graftedlife.org, you'll find a, a tab that says ESDA. Click on that and basically it'll take you to a place where you can interact with a searchable listing. So if you live in Phoenix and you type in, I'm looking for a spiritual director within 50 miles who only does in-person, you can put in all these different things, male, female, it'll pop up who is in your area, whatever those, those search things are that you're looking for. There are plenty of spiritual directors who do online. Do you do online spiritual direction? Kurt? I do. So do I. In fact, I kind of only do online. <laughs> it's like the gift of COVID. <laughs> um, but yeah, so don't let, the fact that maybe you don't find someone near you be a hindrance or a sign that you're not supposed to do this, but maybe look for someone who does online. Here's the thing, too, that would be helpful to know about spiritual direction. You're not married to your spiritual director. But most spiritual directors will give you a time, like one time, uh, an initial time to just say, hey, just see how this feels to you. Like, are we a good fit? And it's a good thing for you to be kind of testing that. Does, do I feel like I I'm comfortable in this setting. And it's also a good time for the spiritual director to be asking God the same questions. So it's, it's, it's an opportunity for you to say, I think I would like to pursue this. Uh, I don't know, you know who that's going to be exactly yet, but you can take your time to try and figure that out. But then once you do kind of have that person in mind that God's kind of brought you together, the cool thing is just, is that consistent returning back to that safe listening place where your soul really can find its melody and, and be able to rest in this love of God that will help you just work out so much of these wounds in a way that, that you really do sense God's, sense God's love and grace in your life. And there's a transforming quality to that that I will just say I've looked back and I look at where I am today and I look back at some of the places of pain. I go, who was that person? <laughs> you know? Um, I'm so thankful that there has been a move toward transformation deep in my soul that has allowed me to not lose my soul in the process wow. of working, quote unquote, for God. So the invitation mm -hmm. is to work with God, to be with God, uh, to not think so much about what we're doing for God, but how we are invited to be or to become because of God's love. Like, I love the story and I love where you're at and what you've shared. And 
I would have one more love if you would pray. I would love it if you'd pray for those listening to be blessed with healing. Yes. There's a prayer that I'll just start out with. It's a written prayer I found. It just simply says, Oh God, help me to believe the truth about myself, no matter how beautiful it is. Just <laughs> let that sink in. But God, we just, uh, we do. We pause right now in this sacredness of this present moment. And I pray that when this is being listened to, it will feel as such a sacred present moment where you are drawing every listener in to your heart of hearts for them in this space we do pray that your voice that voice of love that voice that calls out you you are my beloved and you i'm well pleased would be the voice that is the loudest the voice that breaks and shatters the chains the voice that sets us free the voice that sets us on a course toward that healing work that you, you want to be doing in our lives with our participation, our awareness. And so, Lord God, would you do that? Would you just speak to each person? Maybe, maybe this opens up some kind of an awareness of, of wounds that they've been carrying. God, would you be gentle with us? Would you invite us into your work of grace? your work of, of healing, your work of setting us free, of making us more like Christ, so that we can not just do a lot of things for you, say a lot of good things about you, but really know at the core of our being that we are loved by you. We belong to you. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. We are yours. God, would you do that kind of work? Maybe it's a beginning step. Maybe some people are further down the line. No matter what it is, God, would you give us all the courage, the trust in you to step into that next small step that leads toward life and life abundant with you in your kingdom. We are the beloved. Friend who is listening, you are the beloved. And I bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Yeah, thank you, Adam. That's all there is to say. That was amazing. It really was. Thank you. I'm going to just leave it, up, leave it here and trust it to God. Best way to do it. We will, too. Well, someone has to edit it. Yep. <laughs> just uh, to wrap this up. I want to say thank you for sharing, vulnerably sharing your story and being willing to open, yeah, open your life up for people to, to look in and see the struggle in our culture of image, you know, and in our culture of criticism. <laughs> That's not an easy thing to do. So thank you for taking that risk with us today. Mm. Well, my invitation from God right now is to stop worrying so damn much about what other people think. So. Love it. Love it. I I will say, I suspect that this isn't the last conversation that we get to have together for Life Your Schedules. Yeah. Well, I appreciate yeah. your ministry so much. It's wonderful to be with both of you. And I'm thankful that you would even think to ask. So, thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Life Hurts, God Heals. And if you're curious to know more about us and what we offer, we are part of a larger organization called Elevate Slow, which is a disciple-making movement intent on seeing the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, planted in every culture around the world. If you'd like more information, you can go to our website, ElevateSlow.com. That's ElevateSLO.com. And as always, please remember that you are God's beloved, so be loved. <laughs>